spoiler warning i go fast and heavy with spoilers from the first minute of this video so if you do not want to be spoiled for a storm of swords please click off now nerds what's up so i was gonna start this video talking about jamie i had this whole thing planned out when i was about halfway through the book about how we were just gonna go hard and strong on jamie lannister that was when i was still in summer now we're in winter and the only real option to start off this video is just with the red wedding here's the thing yes it was as emotionally damaging as everyone said it would be somehow even though i didn't quite believe everyone now i do have to tell you my journey with the red wedding because everyone's like what do you mean you like didn't know what the red wedding was okay i had heard red wedding before i had heard it i actually remember specifically when that episode came out because all my friends who were watching it were freaking out and saying like what a big deal it was maybe at the time they told me who it involved I didn't remember so all I had left was like there's a wedding and I guess like everybody dies now a few months ago right after I finished a Game of Thrones I was perusing Reddit and on a complete not even a fantasy subreddit nothing subreddit someone drops that Joffrey dies at his wedding just like in a random subreddit this was actually the reason I decided that I needed to like binge a Song of Ice and Fire as fast as possible because I was just like so angry that the spoiler got dropped but because of that this entire time, I was under the assumption that Joffrey's wedding must be the red wedding. I was like, okay, Joffrey dies, but apparently a, a lot of other people will die. It'll probably be sad, but at least Joffrey's dead. So I was just like, that must be it. Um, and that was obviously incorrect, but I do think that contributed to still even more so being taken by surprise when it did happen because I just, I kept telling myself, well, Joffrey's not here, so it's not the red wedding. We'll get to that. Um, I did... <laughs> I, this was really upsetting. I actually had to take a break. If you follow me on Instagram, like I posted um, a message. I, those those messages that I started my video with are, are real. Um, I read The Red Wedding right before bed. It, <laughs> I was going to bed and I was like, oh, it's late. It's kind of almost past my bedtime, but you know, I'm loving A Storm of Swords. I am just gonna read like one or two chapters before bed. And I read two chapters and, and the last chapter was The Red Wedding. And then I couldn't sleep. I didn't sleep all night, which is really embarrassing to admit, but I actually didn't sleep all night because I was so upset. So when I'm talking about The Red Wedding, I, I want to talk about, like, I have read more visceral things. I have read things where more characters die. I mean, really not that many characters die if like you really think about it in terms of main characters at The Red Wedding. I've read more violent things like, yes, people are dying. So obviously it's a violent scene. But when we talk about like actual descriptors, like the descriptions, how it's being described, like the scene isn't necessarily like that violent. I would say there were scenes that were grosser to me, like in Oathbringer by Brandon Sanderson, who is notoriously known for being a squeaky clean author. It, so what I'm really interested in discussing about The Red Wedding is like, why is it so visceral? Why does it elicit such an emotional reaction? Because I know it's not just me and my love for Catelyn. Everyone, right? This is the reputation. Like I had to put the book down for days. I had to put it down for weeks. Like people told me I threw my book across the room. Like what is it about the way that George R. R. Martin wrote this scene makes it one of the scenes that I... I think it is a scene that has affected me most in fiction. I am not sure a scene has upset me more in fiction than this scene. And I have read a lot of upsetting things. So so why is that? And as I thought about it, I think there's several things that contribute to it. One, I think it is the, <laughs> Martin doesn't hide that this is gonna happen. I have proof in my Clash of Kings review that I am worried about Rob. I said, I am worried about Rob. Theon had this dream. Uh, Stannis throws the slug in the fire. Actually, is that in Clash of Kings or is that in... So I, I read them back to back, so I'm sorry. I might confuse which book some of those are in. You know, they throw the slug in the fire, naming all the kings, and we know one of them already died. So there's always already this worry. Like, you're kind of like, it's... He's telling you it's going to happen. And then... Um, 
you know, while you're re- while you're reading the scene, like I know something is wrong. Just the way people are acting, they wouldn't let Rob's wolf in. But I was like, well, a lot of people might not want that. I started getting really stressed out when Catelyn started listing all the people that supported Rob that weren't there. I was like, why aren't they there? Why are they away? Something's up. But I kept telling myself, I should say, Joffrey's not here, so it can't be the Red Wedding. <laughs> Cute. So it's like this mounting horror. He, um, my friend Leanna from Leanna's Library kind of said, it's like he's writing it like a thriller. Like it's not like you, you see what's going to happen. And I think because again, it's not necessarily like shock factor, but it is shocking because he tells you, Martin tells you it's going to happen. And I think that mounting horror almost makes it worse. Also, Reading this from Catelyn's perspective obviously is a huge issue. Having to hear those final moments from her eyes, watching what basically she believes to be her last child dying. You know, she thinks Rickon and Bran are dead. She thinks Arya's dead. She thinks Sansa will die because of what happened with Jaime. So to her, this is her last family. And she is witnessing that. And the desperation you hear in her head and until the, and how until the very last moment she does not think she is going to die like what a visceral scene like her saying ned always liked my hair long like it it is the way it is written not what happened i think that makes the red wedding both so successful and so viscerally horrible to read one other thing i want to mention about it is i think what also adds to the horror of it is you know, Rob didn't have to offend the phrase like this. And in many ways, Rob died for the same reason Ned died, their honor. Because Rob marries Jane because his honor tells him to, even though it is the incorrect choice, even though it offends the phrase. I mean, that leads directly to his death. Just like my boy Ned, who decided he was going to confront Cersei. Like, why? I don't know. (laughs) Because of honor. And so like the tragedy of like, this didn't have to happen. And it was Rob's honor, just like Ned's honor that ultimately gets him killed. Like it just, it adds, it adds to the entire tragedy of the whole thing. And yeah, I'm emotionally scarred from it. Is that what everyone wanted to hear? I'm emotionally scarred from it. Actually, when I picked the book back up, I waited two days. Like it was weird because I really wanted to keep reading, but I also like didn't. And my heart started racing when I picked up the book again. Like I had like an actual like, dramatic reaction and then it was fine like once I just started reading again I'm spending too long on this but I can see now how perhaps people look at the red wedding and learn the wrong lessons from it I think it's the same I've talked a lot about how like we've learned the long wrong lessons from like the hunger games or anything that becomes popular sometimes we take the wrong takeaway and I think a lot of times the takeaway of the red wedding might be like oh killing your characters at a wedding and like shockingly like that's what works but I really want to just make the thesis that it is the way Martin writes it that makes it work not just the shocking things that are happening within the chapter but yeah like as a stark super fan red wedding was not a great day for me personally not a great day for bookborn <sighs> okay let's move on to something like a little better um Let's just move on. Let's go with what I was gonna talk about Jamie. Unfortunately, I really, really like Jamie, which is just personally devastating to me because I was really annoyed about how everyone loved Jamie so much and I was so excited to be the naysayer, to be the person to come in front of you and be like, no, Jamie sucks. And unfortunately, that is not what happened. Jamie is kind of awesome, so. That is my burden to bear. I didn't really believe you all that seeing from his perspective would change my mind so much. And yet I should have. You guys were right. Uh, You know, Jamie's internal monologue is just so different than I imagined. And how do I describe this? Like, Jamie's been really abused. And look, the incest is gross. And there is no reason it won't be gross. It's always gross. It's gross. So this is not. But here's my, my theory. I'm having a hard time explaining this. It's like. Jamie's been abused by Cersei though, right? What that is my interpretation reading this. Like the way that Cersei talks and Cersei treats Jamie versus the way that Jamie thinks about Cersei and treats Cersei is very 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 different. Jamie has like a weird innocence about it, like a weird like love innocence like kind of groomed quality like he's been groomed from a kid which is weird because I know they're the same age but it feels like Cersei holds all the power and because of that it changes my opinions on why Jamie acts the way he does because it's like abusive like he's been abused you know and 
hearing about the Kinslayer thing from his perspective and remembering how young he was, he was 15 when he was in the Kingsguard, which means I'm guessing he was like 16 when it all went down. I might be like slightly wrong there, but he was definitely a teenager. And how he saw what happened and how he was told, you know, how to act and how he's getting blamed and it's being put on his shoulders just really made me see things differently, like it did. And he's kind of awesome. So that did surprise me. I'm, I mean, his chapters were some of the best. I do want to say a couple of funny things about Jamie. Um, so at the end of Clash of Kings, you know, we we end, we see uh, Catelyn go into the jail cell. And uh, Kyle from Red by Kyle was like, well, what do you think happened? And I jokingly said, well, she probably cut off his hand so that he can't be good at things anymore. And then I was like, JK, JK, JK. It's so clear that she let him go. And then we get to that and she did let him go. And then I jokingly texted him again. I was like, but she should have cut his hand off because then he wouldn't be as dangerous. And so to have his hand be cut off, just like after I joked about it, I like accidentally willed that into existence. Second, after Jamie and Brienne like are on their little questy thingy, I had messaged Kyle and was like, I need Brienne and Jamie to be best friends. And he's like, why are you saying that? Clearly egging me on. And I was like, what do you mean why I'm saying that? It makes a ton of sense. Like, Bran is like stupidly honorable and gives everything away, but Jamie holds everything to his chest, but does actually have a weird amount of honor, but pretends he doesn't. And I made this like whole list of reasons why I wanted them to be best friends. And so then we get back to King's Landing and then they're, no, no, not King's Landing. Um, he, they send him away. I'm like sad. I'm like, okay, I guess, you know, they won't be BFFs. And then he comes back for her. <sighs> oh, I cannot tell you the joy that chapter gave me so much. I mean, he says, I, this is one of the things I marked. I forgot to say, I marked three. I haven't even showed the book. We're talking about a storm of swords in case you're wondering. Um, this was one of the things I marked out of the three things I marked this chapter. A dozen quips came to mind, each crueler than the one before, but Jamie only shrugged. I dreamed of you, he said. I dreamed of you. You gotta be kidding me. Incredible, amazing, perfection. This was my favorite chapter of the book, hands down. It is the best chapter. I will stand by it. Um, it's also one of like three chapters I could actually feel any amount of joy during, so I think that does influence it. But yeah, I loved it. I loved it. Um, Brienne got sent away at the end of the book. But I mean, even like he gives her the sword, like the whole thing. I just need them to be best friends and it's probably not gonna happen, but it's happening in my mind, so. So I think what I'm gonna do is actually, now that I've kind of got the Red Wedding and Jamie out of the way, I'm gonna go through characters like I did last time. I think that's like the easiest way to talk about what's in this book because it's just so much. I almost could have done like a video per chapter, it feels like. So I'm gonna try to get the big things. I realized I had, to, I gave this book five stars. It's, we're like halfway through the video and I haven't even said, the rating. It was obviously five stars. Hopefully you understood that by the way I'm talking about it. Emotionally eviscerating, emotionally devastating, five stars. Um, so I do think A Song of, or A Storm of Swords kind of had the best of both of the first two books. I give both the first two books four and a half stars. A Game of Thrones I thought was perfectly paced. A Clash of Kings I didn't think was as well paced, but I thought it had like super good, deeper um, character development and deeper themes. A Song of Swords, oh my gosh, A Storm of Swords, whatever. It feels like the perfect blend of those two. Like this was crazily paced. Every chapter was amazing. Um, but it also had like really deep themes and character development like Clash did. I will say I'm not gonna go in like the order of my favorite viewpoints like in Clash of Kings. It's too hard for me to choose. This time I didn't think there was a boring viewpoint. Like they were all super good and super interesting. So it's kind of hard for me to specifically say like what were my favorite viewpoints. So we're just gonna go, we're just gonna go down the list. Okay, we're gonna take a brief break here to talk about the sponsor of today's video. And if you're like, Bookborn, you have never had a sponsor before, you would be right. And that's not because I don't get emails. I get emails a lot to sponsor things, but I'm kind of annoying. It's like, if I don't agree that the product would be useful to my group, my, my audience or believe in it or even use it myself, I'm just like not that interested. However, I did get reached out to recently by something that I think would actually be beneficial and kind of has a lot about values that I personally hold dear. Uh, the company Campfire reached out to me 
Campfire is a website where you can enjoy genre fiction through an interactive reading experience right in your web browser. Specifically, they work with authors to give you exclusive bonus content like short stories, world lore, and character profiles as you progress through each book. But why am I so personally into Campfire? Simple, they want to compete with Amazon for self-published authors by actually giving them good terms. I've discussed this stuff before and a lot of booktubers discussed about what Sanderson talked about indie authors and how they get shafted by Amazon. It's why he got pulled his secret projects from Audible. I'm obviously super involved in the indie, indie publishing community. I'm a judge with Mark Lawrence's SPFBO, which is the competition for indie authors. I am married to a self-published author. So these things are kind of near and dear to me. So when I see that there is a site to buy books that's using anti-predatory practices and where authors enjoy the highest rate of royalties, that I've seen anywhere, I'm obviously going to support that. You can create a free account and choose the genres you like to read and cozy up with a new book. So find your next read on Campfire where stories come to life. You can check the link in the description box below to get started with Campfire and find your next great read with lots of amazing bonus content. Now on to more depressing things about A Storm of Swords. Let's start with Catelyn real quick. Cause I feel like I, I mean, the Red Wedding was Catelyn's big thing I needed to talk about. I do want to say that people who said that I wouldn't like Catelyn after book three. Where? Where? Where was it? Where was it in the book? I still like Catelyn. I'm still a Catelyn fan. You know what? She's dead, so my thing, my thing was right. Actually, she's not dead. We do need to talk about that. The end of this book was so wild because you have the Tyrion chapter, which I could spend 30 minutes on. And then immediately after, we have a Sansa. This last chapter of the book is the Sansa chapter, which was incredibly emotionally damaging to me personally. We'll get there. And then you have this epilogue and the epilogue starts a little boring. I mean, not boring, you know what I mean? You're like, okay, it's all done. These are like people we don't really know. Like I know of them, blah, blah, blah. And then it's like zombie Catelyn. It's not a zombie, but <laughs> like the last chapter, like Martin was like, I can't let you get out of this book without the maximum emotional damage and the very last sentence will also damage you. That's what happened. So I guess she's not dead. So like maybe she will annoy me. But as far as book three, I still love her. I will say I was messaging Kyle about this and I was like, she's back from the dead because of the curse. Like she said, you can't kill me because we broke bread at your table. So that's why she's back. And Kyle was like, did you recognize the people she was with? And I was like, yeah, it's the people that Arya was with, you know, the guy who comes back to life. And he's like, yeah, the guy who has a way to come back to life. And I was like, okay, objectively, Kyle, you are correct. Objectively, that is what happened to Catelyn. Objectively. I understand that. But subjectively, in my heart, she's back alive because the phrase are cursed. Because the right of guests was broken. So I just wanna get that out there. Okay, let's move on. Sansa, my poor, poor, poor baby Sansa. I can't believe there are people who dislike Santa or Sansa or hate her because my poor victim Sansa, who is tiny, she is 13 years old and like the most traumatic stuff happens to her. I was so sad. I think there's a quote that's like, no one will ever love me for me. They will only love me or want me for Winterfell. Is that not devastating for her story who dreams of like knights and the, and the perfect princess ending? Um, could not have been more shocked when Peter is the one who gets her out of King's Landing. Floored. Never saw it coming. And what's funny is all of a sudden I started feeling like very warmy towards Peter. I was like, okay, he's been like very sus up until this point. But, you know, he loved Catelyn so much. I guess he sees Sansa as a daughter. He's going to be like a father figure to her. And it was like, finally, Sansa's with someone safe. Sure, she has to be with her insane aunt, who I've never liked. I said that in a Game of Thrones. Lisa, Lysa is wackadoo, and she is even worse than this one. So I'm feeling all warm about it. And then plot twist, he kisses her like a disgusting pervert. And my all my goodwill completely out the window, for obviously. And now I'm devastated. Sansa cannot catch a break. And then her aunt tries to throw her out the moon door. And then Peter pushes her. Like, I'm saying, like, I don't... That chapter was a whirlwind. Ultimately, Sansa is just emotionally broken at this point I'm I just I need Sansa to have a win she's like my other character that I just need desperately for Sansa to have a win she doesn't get any 
And so just please, next book, please, can Sansa have a win if she's in the next book? I know like the next two books, I think only half the characters are in them. So whichever one, just I, I pray for her to have a break. Okay, Tyrion, let me see if I can say anything coherent with Tyrion. Like, I feel like everything in the entire book was crazy, but once again, the ending just like notched everything up. Let's So let's start with the ending, which beginning with the trial, which of course he's getting blamed for this, but what a great scene when he's like, I'm on trial for being a dwarf. Incredible. And then you move to the trial by battle. That's not it. You know what I'm talking about. That was one of the other things I marked. Of the three things I marked, the combat trial by combat or whatever was one of the other things i marked when the red viper is like you raped her you murdered her you killed her children now say her name and he's just saying it over and over and over again as he's fighting him it gave me the feeling of that scene in the princess bride when he's like you killed my father prepare to die you killed my father prepare to die what a great scene I was so happy until the last paragraph of that chapter. So we're going to pretend that didn't happen and just stay happy. Um, what just like a cinematic scene, you know, you can just totally picture it in your head. Loved it. What a great, great scene. I was actually shocked. I was floored that Tyrion killed Shay. It just seems so out of his personality. And I'm super curious to see what kind of after effect that has on Tyrion, because I don't think it's something that he's going to be able to let go. That's just like my own personal reading of the situation like I feel like he kind of killed her in a moment and it just doesn't seem like something he would do so that was really shocking him killing Tywin <laughs> again nothing could have prepared me for him to kill Tywin um what to say about that other than it gave me that same feeling if you've read the Stormlight Archive of something that happens in the Stormlight Archive where a character kills another one really unexpectedly. I won't say Marks, I don't want to spoil it, but if you've read the series, you know exactly which moment I'm talking about. It gave me that same feeling where you're like, well, this is probably bad news and going to be really bad for everybody, but wow, I'm not sad. I'm not sad if that person's dead <laughs> at all. That's definitely something I'm going to do some predictions about later. Like, I just think obviously that moment's going to have such lasting consequences. And then it's a tragedy. Jamie and Tyrion meeting up again, which I talked about the Clash of Kings. Like, I was the most excited for that. And instead, it's a total gut-wrenching tragedy. Jamie is, like, trying to help Tyrion because he doesn't believe he did it. But then Tyrion is so angry because Jamie asked the one question he thought no one, that he wouldn't ask. Did you do it? And why, Tyrion, why do you say yes? Like, I get it. You're angry. But now, now what are we gonna have to deal with? So yeah, that was disappointing slash devastating. It is what it is. Okay, let's move on to Arya. Um, again, her chapters were really good. Very interested in her relationship with the mountain. Very, you know, the mountain's such a fascinating character. Really just up and down with him, you know? Like I, I understand Sandor a lot about him and at the same time, he's just like the worst, but also like I like him so much and I feel for him. Um, and seeing Arya's relationship and kind of that confusing thing with her and also just like how brutal Arya has gotten, how willing she is to just kill people and go there. I'm very curious to see how that is going to affect her in the upcoming books, especially how devastating it is when she keeps saying like, John is the only one who would forgive me. John is the only one who'd see me for who I am. Very interested to explore that continuing you know, trauma that she's having and guilt over the stuff she's doing, but feeling like she has no choice in doing it. Very, very interested in that. I will say I'm not entirely convinced Sandor is dead. Not because Martin doesn't kill characters, but just because I have a rule that if I don't see someone die on screen, I won't necessarily believe they're dead. There's like, I would say like 65% chance he is dead, but I'm holding like a little bit out that he's not because you just, you didn't see it. However, in some ways, I hope he is dead because that scene is crazy when she drives away from him, like, or rides away from him. Just, just really good. John. John was another great viewpoint. I said that about everyone. It's fine. I did find John's uh, chapters way more interesting in this book personally. Like, I thought they were some of his best of both, of all three books that I have read. I'm going to just go on record. Yagrit? Grit? Yagrit? I don't know. You know, his girlfriend. Wilding girlfriend. She's fine. Like, I guess a lot of people really love her. She's fine. I don't dislike her. She's fine. Um, I will say though, her death scene is the last thing that I did mark of the three things I marked because I did think it was such an excellently written scene. We'll go back to the cave, he said. You're not going to die, Ygritte. You're not. Oh, Ygritte cupped his cheek with her hand. You know nothing, Jon Snow. She sighed, dying. 
just really accidentally excellently written i will say i knew the quote you know nothing john snow it's a super famous quote even for someone like me who had never kind of interacted with game of thrones i was surprised such a random quote unquote character said it i guess i always thought one of like the very main characters said that um so it was surprising to me to hear like that such iconic quote come from her. So it was kind of fun to get that in just a way I didn't expect. Uh, obviously him becoming Lord Commander is a huge deal. Interesting for that fallout, especially because where's Rob's letter? Where's Rob's letter? It's somewhere and I just have a feeling Rob's letter is going to arrive. You know, I actually thought it was gonna arrive like right when he became Lord Commander and be like, look, you're a Stark now, everything that you wanted. So I am very curious to see the fallout of that. Like I know Rob's letter is out there and I am waiting for it to surface. Okay, Samwell, I thought it was awesome that we got to see from his perspective. I will say, I think his first perspective chapter is one of the most well-written chapters in the book. Not necessarily my favorite, just well-written because I really couldn't tell if Sam was gonna die or not. Like that's how well it was. I felt the stress, I felt the cold, I felt the desperation and the dying. I feel like it's one of the best chapters I've ever read where you're supposed to feel like it is hopeless for the character. I truly felt it. and honestly thought that the end of the chapter would be Sam laying down in the snow and just dying of, you know, hyperthermia. So I just think it's so amazing how Martin's able to get that stress and tension and write it so well. So I did love that about his perspective. Okay, Danny. Again, she's not in Westeros. So in general, I'm going to be like a little less interested in what's going on over there. Although again, I thought it was a huge improvement from Clash of Kings personally, because what she's doing is just more interesting. Obviously the chapter where she goes ham on the slavers is incredible. <laughs> like so, so satisfying. The way she slowly works that out and then just destroys them all. In fact, I did message Kyle and was like, I think I kind of want to see Amelia Clark just like beating down on all the slavers because that seems like it was probably great. So he found like a YouTube clip. He's like, oh, you can definitely watch it. It's actually not that violent. And he sent me the YouTube clip and I was right. Watching Amelia Clark did that, do that was extremely satisfying. So fabulous chapter. I also like, I had obviously heard the term mother of dragons quite a bit, another famous thing, but I like how much like, I've really enjoyed the exploration of what that means to Danny. Danny is still reeling from the loss of her son. And so when everyone's calling her mother and she feels like they're all her children, I felt very moved by that. And I love that development for her, like how she is viewing herself as mother to all of these people she is freeing and her choice to stay behind, I think is very interesting. So I really am enjoying that aspect of her character. And I just really like Danny as a character. Again, she's not in Westeros so often. It's not the most interesting plot wise or politically, but her as a character, I love. And Sir Jorah being the informer took me by surprise. I don't think it should have. I realized I knew there was an informer that was in Game of Thrones. <laughs> Didn't think it was Sir Jorah and was particularly surprised to hear how late he was informing on her. Sir Jorah is gross. I haven't liked Sir Jorah in a long time. Um, it is funny though, because when she like says go, I literally said out loud, oh no, Danny, you gotta either kill him or forgive him. And then like two paragraphs later, another character tells her that. And I was like, justified, so right. Obviously, Sir Jorah is gonna come back and be a complete menace. So we'll see what happens whenever he comes back. Okay, let's talk about Davos. Um, my baby Davos should not be this far down on the list. Just know that he is king in my heart. He's the best. Um, you know, I'm not a huge Stannis fan. I've been saying that, not a huge Stannis fan. I will say begrudgingly, I had to give Stannis some points in this book when he shows up at the wall and everyone's like, he's the king who showed up. He did it. Begrudgingly, I'm gonna give Stannis a point. However, Stannis shows up because of my dear, kind baby onion knight. So really, I'm gonna give the points to Davos. Loved him being the hand. He's honorable. Um, if you wanna know how I feel about Davos, um, I'm going to read you a message I sent. I said, in the Game of Thrones, you either win or die. But in the Game of Bookborn, you are Starks or nothing. Brienne is an honorary Stark. Davos can come too. <laughs> so obviously love Davos. Cannot wait to see more of him. Okay, and finally Bran. I feel guilty. I almost left Bran out. I kind of forgot about him. But his stuff was good too. I really love Mira and Jojen. Um, I like what they're doing. I just feel like we didn't get like, a lot of development in Bran's plot necessarily this book. I was really sad that Bran and John didn't get to meet up. For some reason, I thought Sam was bringing them to the wall, even though they expressly said they were not doing that. But I just wanted I wanted to start, you know, we almost had Arya get to meet with her brother and mom and that was robbed. And then I thought Bran was gonna go meet up with John and then that was, I just want some Stark to be together. Is that so much to ask? 
Editing Bookborn here. I totally forgot there was something I wanted to briefly talk about with Bran, which is that I know that Bran gets the Iron Throne in the show. That is a spoiler I just happen to know. And what's really interesting is I know that there's some sort of lore that George R. R. Martin gave the showrunners three bits of information, and people theorize that that is one of the pieces of information. And I know that people are very upset with how that went down in the show. And I've heard from reputable sources that they did a terrible job making that make sense in the show. However, I just want to pause it like where I am currently in the books. If George wrote the ending, I could see Bran getting the Iron Throne a reasonable ending, like a satisfying ending. There is a way I could see that happening if Martin was the one to write it. So I just want to throw that out there. I think it's interesting. Now I am a, <laughs> a Stark fan, so I'm probably a little biased. But anyway, I think that's just like an interesting perspective just from someone who it has zero desire or plan to watch the show, but kind of knows that potential spoiler. Okay, a couple of things we need to talk about that aren't characters. Obviously the purple wedding. I knew Joffrey was going to die and that really sucked. I'm really sad that reveal was taken from me. I'd love to know if you were an original book reader or a, a show watcher, although I don't know how different it was in the show, like how it felt to take you by surprise. I knew it was coming, so unfortunately. I will say that I think I would have been suspicious something was happening no matter what, because <clears throat> I didn't know how Joffrey died. And I thought it was really weird when, um, oh, the old lady, I cannot remember her name. You know, the Knight of Flowers, Grandma, or whatever. I cannot. Florence. Well, you know what I'm talking about. When she comes up and is like, oh, let me fix your hair. Um, and is like messing with the hair knot. I was like, they literally just said her hair was perfect two paragraphs before. I know I would have been suspicious about that. Don't think I would have thought Joffrey was going to die, though. So, although maybe I would have, actually. Because I, the slug thing. Like, Melisandre, Melisandre, what? Red Witch. She, you know, we already saw two of the kings die that she threw in the fire so maybe I would have added it's it's just hard that scene is just going to read differently for me because I knew what happened a few predictions I'm not really a crazy prediction person I'm not going to be making some like lore predictions here but one thing I do want to talk about is the death of Tywin because I obviously think that was one of the deaths that's going to have the most intense impacts from this book even though a lot of people died Tywin was really the brains of the Lannister operation and well I mean Tyrion's also the brains but Tyrion's leaving right? And no one listened to him anyway. But Tywin was the brains that people listened to. And now that he's dead, Cersei, I bet, isn't going to remarry. She doesn't want to, so she's probably not going to. Cersei thinks she's really clever, but I don't think she's, you know, really has the instinct that Tywin did. So I kind of think that the hold the Lannisters currently have on King Landing is going to get even weaker. I also think what what's Jaime going to do now that Tywin's dead and he let out Tyrion and they're going to figure out that he killed him? what's going to happen there um that is i think going to have the most lasting effect and i and i guess my prediction is that the lannisters will lose control of king's landing it feels like that only makes sense i already talked about my mild prediction that rob's letter is going to come to john or to somebody and it's obviously going to throw a huge wrench in things and i don't know how john's going to feel because we already know that's all he ever wanted so also where's rickon what's he doing did we did we see him at all this book I don't think we did. So I also wanna know what's going on there. Okay, I am sure there's a lot of stuff I forgot to talk about. Like I said in the beginning, I could have honestly done a chapter by chapter of this book. I felt like every chapter was packed with so much, but then the ending was so smash packed. Like that's kind of the thing I mostly wanted to talk about. Um, this book was great. I understand now why it is widely considered one of the best books of all fantasy. Really just devastating, so much to think about. Um, I am going to take a mini break. I probably won't start books four or book four until maybe January. I've got some buddy reads. I got other stuff I have to read through the end of the year. If it were up to me, I would just read this for the rest of the year. Um, so I'm very excited. I think Feast of Crows is next. I know a lot of people don't feel very strongly about books four and five. They don't like the split thing that happened. And we'll see. I'm not anticipating that's going to really bother me that much, but we'll we'll find out, won't we? As always, if you like these kind of deep dives and you want to keep following me on my A Song of Ice and Fire journey, please like and subscribe. That's the best way to support me. If you want to see what I'm currently reading as well as other nerdy rants or in the moment reactions, like I posted a moment in the moment reaction or the day after of the Red Wedding or just other things like I recently went to Dragonstall Con and posted a ton from there. That stuff is all going to be found on my Instagram where you can find me at bookborn.reviews. I'll see you next time. Bye. 
So the beginning of this video is my real text messages to Kyle from Red by Kyle. However, for humor and brevity's sake, I did condense them. So here are the actual screenshots of the absolute meltdown I had while I read The Red Wedding. My personal favorite part is when Kyle has to tell me that I'm falling apart. So anyway, enjoy. <laughs> 